Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Archang, for your lovely presentation on the website. I think it's, uh, uh, it has been a lot of effort from the knowledge management team, so check it out. It's uh, very cool. I like it. And um, welcome to this session on evidence and research for child protection and accountability. We have a team of wonderful speakers ready to uh, go. And if I can ask the product, please to go um, to, the, um, to let me share my screen for a second. I'll just share some housekeeping before we get started with everyone. So spare with me a second. I want to bring this slide up so you can also read. Um, Okay, we try all this like in the in the rehearsal, but it's not working right now. So just a few reminders for everyone. Really easy, actually, because uh, it's been the flavor of uh, these last three days. So the closed captioning is available, like in uh, for every session. You have to click on more at the bottom of the page, like to get to it. Um, interpretation is also available in French, Arabic. And Spanish. So you have to click on the globe at the bottom of your Zoom panel and choose your preferred language there. Um, you know, thanks to those that have provided the, like the funding to support like all of the languages um, throughout the online meeting. Um, the videos, the, the sessions are recorded and are going to be shared later either on Facebook or on YouTube, depending on uh, our needs. And yeah, just um, Achang already mentioned this, but if you can be on video, that would be great. Oh, thank you for bringing up those keeping notes slides. That's amazing. If you can be on video, be on video. That's obviously if your bandwidth allows. And um, keep your mic muted so that everyone can speak, like without background noise, that it's a little bit distracting. I'm very pleased to be here with you today. and. Um, we're just going to move right into the session. We have, first of all, we're going to be hearing from World Vision International on a case study uh, about uh, children in decision making in fragile context in Syria. So Joy Cheng and Alexandra Matei are joining us uh, from World Vision International. That um, World Vision is going to be followed by a presentation from the University of Bath and uh, specifically Mohamed Al-Bruzzi Arru Ar is joining us uh, for um, the presentation. Later, he will be joined by Jason Ars from the University of Bath to support the discussion. And then finally, we will be hearing again from World Vision <laughs> in Lebanon this time on a research about perceptions and attitudes of faith leaders around violence against children and their perceived a role in achieving uh, child sensitive social protection. Mike Kirakostian and Arsho Tembelian are joining us, are joining us from um, World Vision in Lebanon. So it's a lot of uh, exciting research and sharing that it's going to be happening like throughout this session. So with no further ado, I would like to leave the floor to Joy Chung and uh, colleagues from World Vision International. Over to you. Oh, I'm sorry. I had like a couple of things planned to you and I was just about to skip them. I always seem to do that. <laughs> um, actually, before we get started with those presentations, tell us where you're, um, uh, where you're joining us from so we can get to hear a little like of where everyone is in the world. You can, you can you can click on the mentee link which has just been dropped by our lovely production team Natalie and the rest and uh, just ping yourself on the map and show us where you are and maybe Natalie you can bring up the results slide and I see that the like results are already trickling through there is like a couple of people from somewhere in Africa a few people from Europe several people from Asia and that's growing. Come on. Great. And while you continue to do that, 
Um, I am going to ask you to answer another question through the Menti, but please, Natalie, stay on this slide for this uh, second so we continue to see the results coming up. Um, the, uh, my question would be, um, what comes to mind when you hear the word accountability to children? So that you place yourself by answering that mental question, we would like you uh, to focus as it's morning for many of us, maybe not for all of us, but for some of us, like to, or on the topic of the sessions itself, which is accountability. Um, so you can click on the next mental slide and answer that question with one word or a couple of words. So we'll see uh, what you're thinking of when, you're, when we are talking about accountability. Oh, let's see. Accountability to children, not a mystery for none of you, I don't think, as it's the topic. Engagement, taking children seriously, participation, commitment, I like that one. Feedback, sincerity, child-centered. No, stay on top of stay. I mean, I got it. You and now it's becoming too fast, fast for me to be able to read all of your inputs. Mm, sorry, I went, I was muted for some reason. Um, okay, feel free to continue inputting on that slide and uh, we can show it again maybe at the end, like of oh, the section itself. And uh, for now, let me leave the floor to Joy uh, and the uh, case study from Syria on children in decision making in fragile context. Joy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Elena. And good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here in this session. And thank you for the opportunity to share our work. Uh, I'm actually stepping in for the protection lead in our Syria response team, who is currently on maternity leave. So I'm actually pre presenting this on her behalf. Today, I'm going to present a World Vision tool called uh, CPHA Adapt. If we can move to the next slide, please. So you can see uh, CPHA ADAPT stands for Analysis, Design and Planning Tool for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. Our team conducted a CPHA ADAPT in Northwest Syria around December last year. In this presentation, I'm going to share the learning from the process, the finding and how Warvision is going to use the information. Next, please. So to start with my presentation, I'm going to introduce what is the CPHA ADAPT. It is a unique World Vision tool specifically designed for protracted crisis. Um, the tool focuses on the analysis of strengths and weaknesses of the child protection systems using the socio-ecological model. And there are several adaptable tools for national and local level data collection and analysis on child protection. Some of the activities prioritize uh, listening to the most vulnerable children, as well as their family in the crisis affected population. Through the data collection, the information uh, will be used to inform programming uh, priorities, design and overall strategies. So that's the overall um, uh, uh, review of a CPHA at that. Next, please. Here presents the whole process of a CPHA at that starting from data collection. And there are two levels of data collection. The first one you can see is the national level assessment, focusing on the policy, legal framework, institutional capacity analysis. And this was mainly done through the support of our uh, local legal experts, some volunteer, uh, in addition to uh, some advocacy colleagues. The second level is about the local level assessment. There are several activities that we use to engage children, and this activity followed by uh, the discussion with adults and some other interview with the key informants. With the two level of assessments, we, uh, the team compile and analyze the data, identifying the priority child protection risk, the root causes, as well as the protective factor in that specific context. And then using this information, the team further map out the program uh, interventions, seeing that whether there are specific activities that are addressing the uh, root causes 
or whether there are interventions that are strengthening the protective factors. We also find that some of the root causes of protective factor have uh, none of the activities that are related to those, which means that uh, that will be a gaps that we need to address in our future programming. With the findings, uh, we also present these to our key stakeholders, including the children, the adults, and key informants who were involved in the process so that it generates discussion on what should we do uh, in the future or as the next steps. So that's the complete process of a CPHA adapt. Next, please. On this slide, uh, you can see a beautiful, very colorful problem tree that we asked the bo boys and girls in um, the two locations in Northwest Syria, where we have project implementations uh, to, to participate in the activity. So the children were asked to put uh, the key child protection issue in their areas uh, on a post-it, and then they put it on the branches of the problem trees. They also identified the root causes and then put it again at the bottom of the brick charts. The third step of this exercise is about identifying groups of children who are the most vulnerable uh, to those risks. And then you can see some of the birds uh, sticking on the top of the trees. The, uh, and then after this exercise, the children were also asked to prioritize those issues based on the most important to the least important as the final step of these uh, participatory uh, activities. Next, please. So here are some quotes we got from the uh, children's participant. A boy participant says that, I'm so happy to see that I'm not the only one who feel this way. We also got a girl's participant saying that I'm a female, but it does not mean that the only place I belong is the kitchen. So overall, children see this opportunity as um, a space to share feelings, to exchange ideas, and also get support from each other. And they find this process is very uh, encouraging because they, they get the chance to really talk through the, the concerns. Um, so that's uh, the exercise that they really appreciate. Next, please. Okay, now I wanted to uh, have a poll questions to, to engage you a little bit. If you can click to the menti link to get to the questions. And this question is asked you to guess what are the top child protection risks that children themselves identify in Northwest Syria context? And uh, this is a multiple choice question, so you can select as many as you think that are applied to that, that context. I will give you uh, maybe 10 seconds, 20 seconds to pick your choice. Okay, so we have the majority saying that no safe space for children, some saying that attacks on school, significant stress. Okay, keep changing. So uh, if I can review the answers, uh, the top party selected by the children, as you can see now being highlighted or spotlighted, are the including exposure to drugs, significant stress, child labor, and child marriage. Those that uh, were not being selected do not mean that they were not, uh, uh, this was not the issue in the context. It was just not being picked uh, by the group in, in the, at that process. Okay, thank you for your participation. Maybe we can move to the next slide, please. Thanks. So here, this slides present the um, summary of the finding from the discussion with the boys and girls. And the list are the five top child protection concerns being prioritized by girls as well as boys. You can see uh, both boys and girls prioritize the issue of exposure to drugs in school as the major concern. So it's, uh, they share quite similar concerns between boys and girls. Um, while girls has uh, more concern over child marriage, which is understandable, uh, and boys think child labor is a more serious issue for them. Uh, there is another issue about bullying and assaults that identified by boys, but not really prioritized by girls which is also um, understandable because girls mm. usually tend to spend uh, more time indoor, so they might face less problem of bullying and assaults. With this list, uh, it helps us to also monitor the situation. And as we do, if we do this uh, adapt in, on a regular basis, 
we'll be able to monitor whether there are changes in, in the priority list and whether some of these issues um, were able to, will be able to address through our um, program interventions. So next, please. One of the unique uh, steps in the ADAPT process, which is different from the other tools, is uh, we present the findings from the uh, children's group to the adults. Instead of doing a parallel activity with the adults, we use the data collected from the children and share it with the adults. We believe that this will provide an opportunity to build their capacity in listening to children and appreciating their views. So we do this by adding adults' perspective on top of the children's perspective, not the other way around. And we see this as a, a, the, the major value of the adapts uh, and not a separate process of collecting adults' opinion and children's opinion separately. So we, we will encourage this practice uh, if you are also doing some participatory exercise with the children and adults group. Next, please. So from some of the um, key findings from the adults group, one mothers from the FGD or several of them actually mentioned that uh, the results they present or shared by the children surprised them a lot as they were not aware about what was happening in school. And it was alarming for them to realize that school were actually not the safest place for their children, as they tend to believe. So they, they were somewhat even shocked about the seriousness uh, of the issues that the children are facing uh, inside school. On the other hand, several adults also mentioned that they hold a different view from the children thinking that uh, child labor might not be an uh, issue or might not be a violence against children. A male adult saying that making boys work is the only way for them to become a responsible person. So that uh, is a, a big contradictory to uh, the children saying that child labor is a major child protection concern and is a violence against children. From this finding, uh, it also helped us to understand if we are doing awareness raising, whether we are addressing that uh, uh, adults are not aware about the issue that children are facing, or wh whether adults are actually holding a different perspective. So we can tailor made the message um, in our awareness events or in other activities uh, engaging the adults to address whether it's awareness issue or whether it is a perception issue. Next, please. Okay, here is the second poll I would like to engage you against. Um, if you can guess again, which of the finding below matches both the FGD with children and adult in Northwest Syria context? So there are three options. Which options you think uh, that matches the finding? And it can be a multiple choice again. So I give you maybe 10 seconds again to select your options. We have quite equal number of votes uh, in these questions. Okay, uh, maybe I can also tell the answer. It is the, the first two options that children find a lack of child protection law inside Syria, as well as the lack of accountability are the major reasons that leads to violence against children. Thanks, can we go back to the slide please? Okay. So uh, apart from the two major uh, reasons or root causes, there are several other common risk factors or root causes that we have identified through the ADAPT process with children and adults. Um, both children and adults mentioned extreme poverty mm. is one of the main reasons that uh, trigger negative coping strategy, including child labor and child marriage. The de uh, devaluation of education also causes children's increased exposures to different forms of abuse and neglect. Also, they mentioned about child marriage is allowed under Shia law, and there is no rule of laws in, in the North Syria context. Some specific risk factors were mentioned by the children's group only. Uh, that children do not want to add further burden on the family and children has no voices in the society. So this also, um, this feedback were also uh, shared with the parents group that children were not uh, wanting to add further burdens on the family. Uh, this kind, we found that this kind of sharing also facilitates um, adults understanding on children's concern and the source of stress 
that their children um, are having. So, um, and then uh, we also identify a few, not too many, but there's still uh, a couple of protective factors in the, in the uh, context. Um, people value a lot for their family. They rely a lot on the extended family members. There are friends that are around them that they can ask for support. And there is also um, highly trustful NGO working in the areas. So these protective factors that we can further build upon in our programming, as well as we do um, uh, develop more pro uh, projects to address those risk factors that are being identified by both groups. Next, please. Uh, with the finding from the local level analysis, we use the information to triangulate with the national level analysis, which I mentioned earlier that the, the data collection involved two level of assessments. Uh, in the national level data collections, um, we use uh, a list of 27 indicators that uh, are, are related to on policy status uh, regulatory framework on violence against children. And there are several subsets of questions under each indicators to review these eight areas, uh, including the legal progress and the pre uh, preparedness to implement. Uh, you can see from these um, slides, uh, in the area of forbids, it got to the highest score. And what we find in the Northwest Syria context is that there are several um, policies about um, forbiddance of physical punishment in school setting, uh, but not in the family setting. So it gets a, a relatively high score, but um, at the same time, it doesn't pass the 50% uh, mark, but already it's, it's the highest among all the other areas that we analysis, uh, we analyze. Um, and in the areas of reports, funding, data management, and awareness uh, raising by local authority all got 0%, which means there is no legal framework or no budget or actual actions in those areas. With this national level analysis, it also helps us to identify where will be the entry points for our system strengthening approach. So if we see that there is already some policy in the school environment, then it provides an entry point for us. When, it, when we review the response, we also identify that there is uh, the healthcare system and social services provided for survival of violence. So we also identify that the health uh, sector is another entry point for us to strengthen the systems. Um, I'm aware of the time, so let me um, uh, stop here about the, the national level uh, analysis and move to the next slide. So to, sum, to conclude my um, presentation and with the finding in the ADAPT, uh, it happens to prioritize some of the following actions. Uh, one included the facilitation of the conversation and activity between children and adults, as we realize that adults are not aware of the children's concern. There are um, also um, areas that we can, we can use to identify gaps to address those risk factors and strengthen the protective factors. Um, there is also indications that there is a need to scale up integrated program, especially with the education sector and the um, livelihood and cash programming. Lastly, uh, we do more advocacy with our humanitarian stakeholder cluster and other working groups and donors to prioritize child uh, participation in fragile contexts, as well as to advocate to integrate CPHA ADAPT as part of the regular assessment. As we do believe that this should not be a one-off uh, process, but an ongoing uh, regular activities to engage children and adults and continue to collect the feedback on those risk factor and protective factor and future programming. So I would like to end my presentation with a positive story of Fatima. Fatima was forced to get married when she was 14 years old. And with the support of Vervision, she is using social media to spread awareness about the risk of child marriage. And this is another way that uh, Vervision support children and adolescents participation. And I hope you enjoy the short video of Fatima. إذا صرت رئيس دولة ليوم واحد أول شيء بنهي 
الحروب من العالم كله بحط قوانين جديدة للمرأة قوانين ما حدا يزوج بنته تحت عمر 18 أنا فاطمة عمري 18 سنة من سوريا فيقتي حكيت لي عن مركز اس ار دي شو بيقدم خدمات وحبيت خذ هالتجربه فكانت تجربه كثير حلوه وتعلمت كثير قصص مثل عززت ثقتي بنفسي كمان يعني حسيت انه في شيء فادني حسيت حالي انه انا عن جد موجوده انثى موجوده بهالعالم عندي صفحة على انستغرام كنت شارك فيها بنات كثيرة نحكي حلول نحكي شو كل وحدة هي ومشكلتها ونحاول نساعد بعض عن التحديات اللي عم تعيشها فتيات سوريا هي مثل ترك التعليم الزواج بالغصب الزواج المبكر كمان يعني في قصة بدي ركز عليها هي التحرش الفتيات اللي عم تصير بالمخيمات هي يعني من أنواع العنف ضد المرأة إيه بتمنى أنه نخلص من هالشي يعني عندي كتير شغلات إن شاء الله بس أكبر رح أحقق أه. أه الحياة بالنسبة إلي أه مثلها مثل أي عائلة سورية أه عم تنتظر الحروب لحتى تحقق أحلامها Thank you so much. Uh, the full at uh, that report is available on World Vision website. We can share the link with uh, you if you are interested to read more about it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joy. And uh, now over to Mohamed Arruzi. Mohamed, the floor is yours. Thanks, Elena. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening depending uh, from which part of the world you are joining today. Uh, my name is Mohamed Ruzdi, and I am a research associate at the University of Bath. And today I will be uh, reflecting a little bit on the research finding uh, we conducted at the university, uh, which was funded by uh, one of the research council in the UK, uh, AHRC and FCDO. And the research was uh, primarily uh, about child neglect uh, in the humanitarian uh, uh, settings. Um, and I will be joined later by my colleague Jason Hart, who will join us also for the discussion and the Q&A uh, question. Uh, next slide. Probably to start uh, this presentation, I'd like to uh, maybe get some, um, some of your point of view about the forms of maltreatment in the humanitarian uh, uh, settings. And the question that we have is, which of these forms of maltreatment affect the largest number of children in humanitarian uh, settings? Of course, there's no uh, wrong or, uh, or right answer for these questions, but just uh, for us to, to start that, uh, that discussion. Um, shall we give it um, 15 seconds and then maybe now we can show the results. Wow, this is unexpected. It is interesting to see how the different participant uh, rank uh, the prevalence of forms of maltreatment. As we can see, 48 of the participants reported that it is neglect, and then it is violence, and then abuse, and then it's exploitation. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, reliable information or statistics about the prevalence of each of these uh, forms of maltreatment. So this was really uh, a guesswork. But I think what I would like to uh, highlight here that usually uh, neglect is one of the aspects which um, are less discussed in the humanitarian settings and in humanitarian actions. Usually, whenever we are speaking about child protection, 
we focus on exploitation, violence, abuse, because they are easier to uh, to be detected, unlike the neglect, which is very uh, difficult to identify and very difficult to to uh, to uh, detect. And I think in response to that, in 2018, uh, the Alliance launched a study which focused on neglect in humanitarian settings. And this was an important step in tackling that question and addressing that gap in the literature and research and also in practice uh, when it's come to, uh, to neglect. And one of uh, the findings of that study of, or the literature review of that uh, study was that uh, neglect was the most uh, common form of maltreatment experienced by children around the globe. Although this doesn't necessarily apply to uh, the humanitarian uh, uh, settings. And this is what, what motivated us in, in doing this research um, to focus on neglect specifically and to understand more about the dynamics of neglect, how it can be identified and how it, it is uh, perceived. Uh, next slide, please. So we started this project uh, two years ago and uh, with the focus on neglect in the humanitarian uh, settings. And in particular, we were uh, interested in understanding the di different manifestations of neglect in humanitarian settings, drawing on uh, two sites, Jordan and Palestine. And in particular, we were interested in understanding uh, uh, the underlying causes uh, uh, of child neglect in humanitarian settings, and then uh, trying to uh, investigate how neglect can be identified in these settings. And in doing so, we were trying to focus on four uh, forms of uh, child neglect, including physical, medical, educational, and supervisory uh, neglect. And these are uh, some of the forms of neglect which has been highlighted in the study which was commissioned by the Alliance in 2018 on child neglect and humanitarian uh, uh, settings. Uh, in this presentation, I will not speak about all of these forms. Probably we don't have time for that, but I will speak uh, more about the physical neglect, the first one of these four uh, in, the coming, uh, in, in the coming slide. But to give you a uh, context about that research, I'd like to move to the next slide and speak about the methodology of that uh, project. Uh, it has basically two sites, Jordan, and in Gaza Strip in Palestine. And in Jordan, we worked with uh, four different refugee communities, including Sudanese, Somali, uh, Iraqi, and Syrian refugees. While in the Gaza Strip, we worked with uh, Palestinian refugees communities, especially those are, uh, who are registered with UNRWA, uh, the leading UN agency for Palestinian uh, refugees. And as part of that research, we conducted more than 170 interviews uh, with children and caregivers. And these were facilitated by uh, 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 community members, refugees themselves, with their communities uh, in each of these different sites. And in addition to that, and to make the research more inclusive and participatory, uh, we engage children th through uh, theater and space, uh, art-based uh, workshops with uh, children in both of the Gaza Strip and, um, uh, and Jordan. Uh, and in addition to that, we uh, understood the importance of engaging also with the humanitarian actors. So we conducted more than 20 uh, key informant interviews with child protection uh, professionals. Some of them are, were working in the region, others were globally, uh, and they have extended expertise in, uh, in focusing on issues of child protection and specifically uh, on, uh, on neglect. Um, just to move quickly to the findings, I would like to move to the next slide and start another uh, uh, quick quiz. And we have now a new question, which is, which of these is most commonly seen as the cause of child neglect in humanitarian uh, settings? 
Is it the attitudes and practices of caregivers? Is it the incapacity of caregivers due to social and economic uh, conditions? Or third, is it the inadequate support uh, from the humanitarian uh, uh, system? Uh, again, there is no uh, right or wrong answer, but it will be interesting to, to see your views uh, on the, uh, uh, in, in response to that question about the causes of uh, a child neglect. Maybe we'll take uh, 20 seconds and then uh, we uh, continue. Okay, thanks a lot for contributing to this quiz. So as we can see, most of the participants think that um, the cause for child neglect in a humanitarian setting is the incapacity of caregivers due to social and economic uh, conditions. And it is surprising because uh, when we spoke to many humanitarian actors in the field, uh, many there was a kind of uh, a conviction that a humanitarian professional tend to think that child uh, neglect uh, was a commonplace and it was caused primarily by the attitudes and the practices of the caregivers. So usually it's the caregivers who are usually blamed for neglecting uh, the, their children. And this is why, as part of our research, we decided to look at the wider humanitarian system and to go beyond the idea of blaming the caregivers and uh, uh, looking at the broader system, the humanitarian system, and to what extent the humanitarian system is enabling or disabling the capacity of the caregivers to provide and to care for their children, and thus preventing neglect from happening in the first uh, uh, place. Um, and uh, maybe to explain that, uh, we should have a look at the humanitarian system and how is it composed and how the different relations uh, between the different actors uh, impact caregivers and their capacity uh, to provide for their uh, children. So maybe we move to the next slide, please. So as you can see, uh, we have here a diagram which show the different actors who are usually involved in the provision of the humanitarian action. And of course, obviously, you can see that the humanitarian organizations is just one uh, element of that, of that system. Uh, but uh, what came uh, out as part of our research uh, is the reflection of the refugees and other beneficiaries from the humanitarian system and how uh, they think that the humanitarian system sometimes fail to enable them and to give them the tools uh, to provide and to care for, uh, for their uh, children. And uh, here, for example, we can see the um, different uh, blue boxes and we can see um, how each of these elements impact caregivers, for example, how the government and its policies and the laws and the regulations impact caregivers' capacity uh, to provide for the children, how the, diff how the humanitarian organization as well impact uh, 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 caregivers. But I think in our research, what was more uh, important is to look at the interaction between these different actors, how, for example, the host government interactions with the humanitarian organizations eventually impact the caregiver's capacity to provide and uh, and help uh, caregivers to provide uh, to take care of, of of the children. How the local institutions are also impacted, for example, by the donors. How the humanitarian organizations are tied sometimes by uh, principles of a humanitarian work or any uh, or other principles and how this eventually uh, affect uh, the capacity of the caregivers uh, to provide for children. And we identified two forms of neglect here. Uh, the first one is when, for example, uh, one of these elements decide to exclude uh, caregivers from service provision. Think about, for example, a host government 
that doesn't recognize a group of refugees. Um, the most obvious example to this is, for example, in Jordan, the Jordanian government doesn't recognize uh, uh, refugee groups as refugees, except the Syrian. And this has many repercussions in terms of provision of services, including access to education and medical care and job market for the caregivers. And all of this affects how uh, caregivers respond and um, uh, attend to the, to the needs of, of, of the children uh, as well. And it was also uh, reported as part of that, uh, uh, of the interview that we have conducted, the indirect link between these different actors and how these affect uh, uh, the capacity of the caregivers uh, to provide. And this is what we call indirect uh, neglect. And this is happening, for example, when uh, the host uh, government put some kind of conditions on the humanitarian organizations and how to uh, apply its policies and how to act in certain kind of uh, situation and how the caregivers at the receiving end are usually negatively impacted by uh, these kind of uh, uh, policies. And these are just a few examples of how uh, the structure of the humanitarian system is, is usually affecting and sometimes negatively the capacity of the caregivers uh, to take care of their uh, uh, children. Uh, and to give you an example, probably maybe we can move to the next slide. Uh, and here, for example, um, I would like to, to speak about two uh, themes which came out as part of our research in Jordan. And it was about uh, the theme of uh, violence and abuse in the streets and leisure spaces and schools in Jordan. So a Somali mother uh, uh, resident in Amman uh, was reporting last summer that my son two teeth are half broken by some random kids who throw an object at him. He doesn't know them except one. His back was torn with a metal cover uh, of a tuna can. Um, he, he has many scars on his back, but he sees none of them. He only sees half broken teeth and uh, the other son cannot forget about his eye. So here we can see that for if if we can easily blame this mother for not attending to the uh, needs uh, uh, and providing supervisory uh, support for her kid but we have always to contextualize this in the wider system and also here we have another example from gaza uh, because of the destructions and uh, the accumulation of the rebels uh, in the in the urban areas children are at risk of being injured uh, and this affect how uh, children are um, experience safety and how uh, they have access to physical physical spaces and physical safety uh, as beneficiary of the humanitarian uh, uh, system um, just to, for the sake of time, I'll move to the next slide and just give uh, some concrete examples of how the humanitarian system sometimes produce uh, forms of child neglect. Uh, for example, in Jordan, the Jordanian government doesn't recognize uh, different groups of refugees uh, apart from the Syrian refugees. Uh, the public sector employees usually uh, uh, practice forms of discrimination against refugees and this result in eliminating and uh, kind of uh, excluding children from having access to different services including the ones which are very necessary to them like education and medical care and bureaucracy here play uh, an important uh, role in uh, making the lives of the people more complex by uh, eating up time and attentions of the caregivers. So think about a mother that she has to get a lot of registration, a lot of paperwork done, but at the same time she has to attend 
uh, to her kids, uh, providing physical and emotional and educational and medical support at the same time to those uh, to those uh, children. And in addition to that, that in the context of the humanitarian uh, action, it's usually very difficult to attend um, to the material needs of the children when uh, there is a lot of limitations on the fund which is available uh, uh, to those uh, to those caregivers. Um, most of the caregivers are not allowed, for example, to work in Jordan. And because of that, they cannot provide uh, the sufficient material support for their uh, for their children. And we can see similar dynamics, of course, uh, because of the political situation in the Gaza Strip in Palestine, these uh, man manifest differently in that in that sector. And here we are speaking about uh, the control of the donors, uh, uh, like uh, which are unable to challenge the Israeli government, the insufficient measures to remove uh, severe hazards following destructions of the building, and the lack of the uh, spaces. Uh, just for the final one more slide, and I will conclude. Uh, I think it's very important, uh, and these are some of the lessons we learn as part of our research is very important to engage with caregivers uh, and children uh, through a genuine participation. And it's through that kind of engagement that we will uh, be able to understand uh, the question of neglect and engage uh, with it and address it. And I think it's very important to, uh, to attend to the question of neglect uh, more in the humanitarian sector because it's one of the most common uh, forms of child of child maltreatment in humanitarian settings and it's very important if we can give more attention to that the work of the alliance was very important in that direction and we hope that our study also contribute uh, in giving more attention uh, to that to that area and I think we need to stop, as a humanitarian actors, we need to stop blaming caregivers for failing to provide for their kids and shift our attention to the system as a whole, how the system is sometimes enabling and disabling for, uh, for the children. Uh, thank you so much, and sorry for exceeding my, uh, my time. And uh, back to you, Elena. Thank you, Mohamed, and don't worry about the time, that's fine, we'll uh, pick up on that. And um, now I would like to leave the floor to Mike Kirakosten and Arshu Tembelian from World Vision Lebanon. Over to you. Thank you, um, Mohamed, for, for this great presentation, and thank you, Elena, for uh, giving us the floor. Uh, I'm going to jump right into it. So. Our presentation is about the research that we did in World Vision Lebanon uh, regarding the perceptions of faith leaders uh, and their role in uh, violence against children or uh, targeting and contributing to violence against children prevention. Um, evidence shows that faith leaders play an influential role in changing beliefs, attitudes, and practices that undermine child protection, but they can also be used for perpetuating, justifying, and hiding harmful cultural practices. Given the faith leaders' important role at the community and the judicial levels, World Vision in Lebanon is partnering with faith leaders to leverage their influence uh, and catalyze change in violence and harmful gender practices against children. Leveraging this role should be conditioned by understanding faith leaders' knowledge attitudes and views on child protection to ensure they serve as effective advocates. To understand those better, World Vision conducted the following study, which aimed at understanding the perceptions and attitudes of faith leaders around violence against children and their perceived role in achieving child-sensitive social protection. We explored perceptions and attitudes specifically around violent child discipline and examined faith leaders and faith-based organizations' roles in preventing gender violence inside and outside of the household. Some of the specific objectives included understanding how to better incorporate the role of faith leaders in child protection programming to strengthen designs for behavior change programs and influence policy to ensure the centrality of 
and accountability to children in decisions that affect their lives. To go over the key themes, methodology and evidence, the study team used a qualitative cross-sectional design, which is a type of research design where we collect data from many different individuals at a single point in time, observing uh, variables without influencing them. With a latent approach to assess the perceptions of faith leaders, a qualitative approach was employed to allow for the exploration of complex ideologies and permitting for a detailed depiction of perceptions and attitudes using in-depth interviews. The study team used a deductive directed design as well with predetermined categories and outlined themes informed by prior knowledge and research codes to guide the analysis of the data. The research included faith leaders, as I said, from both Muslim and Christian religions residing in North Lebanon, Beirut and Mount Lebanon. A female quota for the sample ensuring the inclusion of female faith leaders was applied. Here are some findings that, that are important to share. The majority of faith leaders believe that the use of violence as a child disciplining approach is neither justifiable nor acceptable. However, when probing further about their acceptability of violent child discipline, there was a shift in some of the opinions where five out of 18 faith leaders mentioned that violence in some cases is needed. Moreover, some faith leaders thought that girls are subject to harsher disciplining methods, while others thought the opposite. Of those who mentioned that girls are subject to more violent discipline, attributed this to cultural beliefs rooted in the honor of the girl, which mirrors the honor of the family. The vast majority of faith leaders agreed to the prevalence of violence against children in society and in, in their communities, especially during COVID-19, and is more prevalent in families with children with disabilities. Those were occurring during, uh, uh, due to existing cultural and social norms that fuel violence against children. And those are linked to parents' cultural upbringing. Almost all faith leaders stated that their main role in preventing violence against children lies in preventive approaches, such as educating parents and offering support as representatives of their congregation. They added that they don't have any participatory role in religious court decisions. Some faith leaders opposed to mere, the mere idea of divorce as it contradicts the teachings of their faith and affects the child negatively regardless of their opinion on whether the decision is child-centered or not. Others explain that some courts follow the laws as they are without assessing the best interests of children and women. And the reasons behind that is attributed to nepotism and favoritism. Before I hand to my colleague, Arshu, here's a quote from one female faith leader. At the present time, the decisions are not centered around the child and the woman because they consider that they are quote unquote less or deficient and that the woman is emotional and cannot bear responsibility alone. I hand now to Arshu to tell us more about the strength and limitations of the study. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> so the study has a number of strengths. The study was the first, <clears throat> excuse me. The study was the first attempt to evaluate through a qualitative assessment the faith leaders' perception and attitudes around violence against children and their perceived role in achieving child-sensitive social protection. The qualitative design of this study had to collect rich and detailed information to describe yet unexplored experiences and perspectives on most of the study themes, which would have not been achieved had we chosen the quantitative methods to answer the research questions. Next, the sampling frame was purposeful in including participants with diverse backgrounds in different settings to ensure advanced representativeness. The sample was diverse in several characteristics, including sex and religious background. The study employed consistently the developed interview guide and utilized structured coding and data analysis to ensure rigor. As for the limitations, the subjectivity and non-probability based nature of the unit selection in purposive sampling, which restricts the representativeness of the sample, but it helps 
shape an initial understanding of the perception of faith leaders. And the study team tried to tackle this limitation by adopting maximum variation sampling, MVS, also known as heterogeneous sampling approach, with, which involves selecting candidates, in this case, faith leaders, across a broad spectrum relating to the topic of the study, which is religion in this case, to look at the research questions from all available religious angles and perspectives, thereby achieving a great, greater understanding. Finally, albeit limited to only a number of women faith leaders, which might have limited our understanding and appreciation of their experiences compared to their men counterparts, their mere inclusion helped ensure their representativeness. I want you now to go to the Menti link that is provided, and I want you to answer this question. Describe the role of faith leaders in preventing violence against children in one word, two words, or the way you like to describe it. And we will be seeing all together, how are you describing the role of faith leader? There is a typo over there. It should be faith leaders in preventing violence against children. Waiting for your results and input on this question. Raising awareness, promoting awareness of violence against children in their community and using the faith teachings to influence positive behaviors. Influence behaviors, attitudes, and policy for children and women. Again, there was a typo, faith leaders, F-A-I-T-H, uh, not fake leaders, as it is mentioned on one of the descriptions. Positive change, raise awareness, prevent negative behaviors. Thank you for the description that you have uh, stated as the role of faith leaders. I will read two more, connection with identitarianism, call for more participants and raise their awareness of CP. Uh, thank you. Now we will be going to watch two videos by two faith leaders from Lebanon. هدف الأسرة صح إنه نتشارك مع ربنا بالخليقة ولكن كمان نعرف كيف نربي ولادنا صح ونميز بين التربية وبين الأساس. اليوم أنا وقت بدي أعلم ابني شيء جديد مش بالأساس بعلمه وبضربه وبجعل عنده ألم يلي بيخليه يزبط سلوكه عن طريق الألم لا أنا بدي ربي الولاد يعني أنا أعلمه وأزرع فيهم شيء جديد العنف منه بس جسدي العنف بيكون كلامي والعنف يمكن يكون سلوكي بنظرة بحركة من الأهل بعنف ولادهم بطريقة بيزرع فيهم عقد كتير نفسية اليوم شيء كتير مهم نعلم ولادنا ونحن نتعلم نحكي مع بعضنا ونسمع بعضنا كتير مرات البيات بيحبوا يحكوا بس مع الأسف ما بيحبوا يسمعوا لا أنا بدي أعلم ابني أنه مثل ما أنا عم بحكي معه أنا كمان بدي أسمعك وأنت بدك تحكي معي لأنه هيدا الشيء بيخلي الولد تزيد السئة عنده ويعرف كيف يتواصل مع المجتمع الخارجي برا البيت فالولاد هن استثمار كتير مهم بحياة الأهل لازم يشتغلوا ويكون شغلهم شاغل ليلا ونهارا إنه أنا كيف بدي طلع من بنتي إنسان ناجحة كيف بدي طلع من ابني إنسان ناجح يقدروا يكفوا حياتهم وما يكونوا اتكاليين يكونوا عندهم شخصيتهم القوية اللي بيقدروا يعبروا عن ذاتهم ويشكروا أهلهم على هيدي التربية هدف الأسرة صح أنه نتشير اتفقوا الأديان السماوية والأوانين الوضعية على أنه عمر الطفل من 0 إلى 18 هذا العمر ممنوع فيه عمالة الأطفال لازم نحترم فترة الطفولة ليقدر يتعلم ويرفع عن نفسه ويلعب هاي الفترة الأساسية اللي ممكن يستغل فيها هذا الشيء ما يشتغل إلا بحالات قصوى من عمر 14 إلى 18 سنة إذا في ضرورة قصوى لإعالة الأسرة بحال عدم وجود معين لألا العمالة بتأدي لارتدادات سلبية نفسية وجسدية على الطفل لذلك بهيد الفترة دور الأهل أساسي كتير بتوعية أطفالهم وتوجيههم ليقدروا ينطلقوا بالحياة بشكل صحيح مع الحفاظ على حقوقهم من ناحية التعليم واللعب 
بهذه الطريقة بيكونوا حافظوا لهم على الناحية النفسية والجسدية لهم اتفقوا الأديان السماوية و... Thank you, Arsho, uh, and uh, thank you for our uh, dear producers for uh, showcasing those videos. Um, I'm going to ask Arsho now one question, which is shown on the slide. Uh, what is the perception and role of faith leaders, uh, faith and faith leaders in preventing violence against children, uh, including sex-based discrimination in violence against children? Thank you, Mike. I want to start by quoting a Protestant uh, uh, faith female faith leader from BML. She said, and I quote, types of violence against the child are verbal, physical, and moral, which leads to harming the child, whether for a short or a long term. Violence may come as a response to the needs of the family. Violence is common for girls through early marriage and for boys through forcing them to go to the street and beg so that they bear this responsibility that they must secure money for the family and this destroys the child's childhood. <clears throat> when defining VAC, the definition across the different faith leaders was analogous, with its core relying predominantly on violence as maltreatment to harm to the child that can take many forms, including physical, emotional, verbal, psychological, and sexual. In terms of discrimination, the majority of the interviewed faith leaders agreed that sex-based dis discrimination in general exists in the society. Some of the Christian faith leaders elaborated that their religion calls for equity between both sexes, while acknowledging differences between sexes on the basis of awareness, behavior, and physical features. They define discrimination in general as bigotry and inequality in treatment between the two sexes based on prejudices and the few mentioned that this sort of discrimination is violence in itself. One Muslim faith leader also highlighted that his religion's calls for equity between both sexes explaining in terms of inheritance where religion's calls for equal inheritance between male and female children. While only few touched on sex-based discrimination in VAC specifically, they link it to examples of different violations of child rights on the, uh, on the basis of uh, uh, child marriage, child labor, begging, and education. There was a consensus of their role uh, on social or uh, of their role or social status uh, within the community where it allows them to have an access and closer insights to the families. As mentioned, faith leaders will help them establish dialogue with both parents and the children and hence establish trust based on which access to personal matters was granted. And this facilitated this awareness and identification of the AC cases. All the faith leaders reported that they come to know about VAC cases through reports from family members, communication with the parents, either through the home visits or consulting with them, or through children, either whether uh, children would disclose these practices or uh, it will be shown through their body language and signs. All faith, be, faith leaders believe that their role is in spreading awareness and the teachings of religion to help people and guide them towards correct actions, including child rearing and lifestyles. Almost all the faith leaders stated their main role in preventing VAC relies in preventive approaches through educating parents and through offering support as representatives of the congregation or faith community. Faith leaders explained that education is coupled with providing parents with alternative ways on how to control oneself, deal with, guide, uh, deal with and guide the child. The faith leaders mentioned different means for the exchange of knowledge, including meetings, gatherings, Friday prayer meetings, preaching in the church, and training sessions. So this is in a nutshell. Mike, I want to ask one last question. Where do faith leaders stand on the issue of BCD? What influence do they have on social and cultural norms related to BCD? Or can, can or should faith leaders change these norms? 
Yes, thank you so much, Arsho. So this final question is on uh, slide two. Uh, so th there was a consensus about the existence of cultural and social norms that fuel violence against children. Uh, though some faith leaders believe that the effect of these norms in societies is gradually diminishing, they link those norms to parents' cultural upbringing. And, and some said that these norms vary across societies, areas, and sects and that they are more common in rural setting and in financially disadvantaged families. Some faith leaders also mentioned that the majority of the society abides by those um, cultural norms and follows them blindly, uh, even without questioning the reason or reasoning behind them. It was not noteworthy to mention that uh, on this note, a Christian faith leader from Tripoli highlighted that harmful norms are common in the society and passed on from one child to another due to the absence of care from adults. When asked about changes in these norms and their roles or contribution to the change, the majority of faith leaders believe that fighting against these uh, harmful social norms and achieving change requires shifting people's mindsets from following harmful social habits towards more positive and child-centered decision-making and practices. The aforementioned study also, according to faith leaders, can be achieved through listening to people and through working on the mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, and social nurturing to attain self-awareness uh, among the members of society. They highly perceived their role as mentors and educators and mentioned that their contribution to this change can be done through training parents and guiding them on the correct ways on how to deal with children. Uh, I hand now to Elena or I think, uh, yeah, Camilla, I don't know. Thank you so much for listening in. Thank you, Mike. So, yeah, you were right. It's back to me. Thank you so much for your presentation. And um, I would like now to introduce Camila uh, Jones, who is the co-coordinator of the Alliance. You have uh, surely met her like in the last couple of days of the annual meeting. And she'll be facilitating like a quick um, Q&A session. So if you do have any burning question, do put them in the chat and we'll see what we can do. If we cannot take your question because of the limited time, don't worry, we can always pick up on them and get the answer across to you over email or in another format. Um, over to you, Camilla. Thank you, Elena, and thank you to all the speakers. I think it's been absolutely fascinating and I've really enjoyed hearing these kind of great calls to action, lessons learned, um, and some of the synergies between the different presentations. I've noticed a few takeaways uh, for myself that I thought I'd share with you. Um, children enjoy being listened to. It clearly makes them feel good, feel empowered. It's good for their resilience. Um, we need to engage adults to build their capacity to listen to children. So being part of these processes of research can actually help them in their longer term work with children. Um, but also we need to adopt these kind of very organized approaches to assessment that have been demonstrated in Joy's presentation. And uh, Mohammed then encouraged us to identify protection issues in context, um, ide identified through a deep engagement with local actors, which I think has been quite well demonstrated in Mike and our shows work with faith leaders, really looking at that particular group of uh, people and influences in the local context, what they think, what they can do. Um, and then I also noted um, that uh, the policy review and analysis uh, presented in Joy's um, study showed a sort of limited prevention focus and uh, a limited focus on family settings. So you know, the, the legal and policy framework didn't look at child protection issues in the home. But yet then again, um, Mohammed's encouraging us to think beyond the home and to think about the nexus, if you will, between the humanitarian system and caregivers and how they need to come together to equip families to actually provide the care that they're not able to provide if the system and the duty bearers aren't doing their, their role properly. So I thought I'd share a few of those uh, reminders of what we've covered today and, and try and drink, bring together a few of the synergies to help the participants as they come up with their questions. I'm sure they'll have many, but just to start us off, we've got one question to pose to the panelists, which is um, what are the implications of your findings 
for the effort to achieve greater accountability to children. So if I go one by one, we'll start off with Joy and see what she has to say there. Over to you. Yes, I'd like to make you like this. Uh, Thank you, Camilla. Thanks for the questions. I think Hello. one of the major implications or reflections from our CPHA ADAPT is how organization can uh, support to create the environment, facilitate conversation between children and adults. In the ADAPT process, which I described, um, we, we managed to present the findings of the, from the children's group to the adults, but I would see this as just the first step. If we need to move uh, one step ahead or further, we need to facilitate maybe even with the children presenting the information directly to the adults, uh, encouraging that direct interaction and conversation, which I believe we need to uh, further support and build capacity of our local team to be able to do so. As you can imagine in, in a more relatively conservative environments, uh, facilitating such kind of conversation might also um, cause some conflicts on tension between the, the children and the adults. So I would see it as a continuous effort that we need to work on to create such environments, to build the confidence of the children to talk through um, their concerns with the adults directly. Uh, another implication I would say is um, how we can use this uh, information generated from one exercise or activities uh, to build into the wider systems and uh, also to, to use this information to fit into the other mechanisms mm -hmm. that we also collect feedback and playing or information from the different groups. So as CPHA ADAPT is just one exercise, um, the, the ability to really utilize and provide the feedback um, back to the participants uh, from the different system and using it as a as a whole uh, mechanism is another challenge and is another uh, areas that we need to continue strengthening. So that's uh, the little input that I have. Thanks. Thank you, Joy. So how do we safely engage children in, in, in sharing their views? How do we make best use of the data we've collected for many different purposes? Was what I heard from that. I'll pass to Mohammed for the same question of the accountability um, implications of your research to achieve greater accountability to children. Thanks, Camila. I think uh, right from the beginning in our research, we had a deep commitment to uh, accountability, and this is reflected in the way we implemented this research. So uh, right from the beginning, we engaged with researchers in the, um, from the refugee communities in undertaking the research and defining the questions and in setting the agenda for this research. And this was um, uh, reflective of our commitment to uh, accountability. And I think throughout this process, which lasted for the last two years, we came to, to see how important and how productive it is to use that approach and how this can have uh, good implications for accountability. Because through that uh, participatory and engaging process, we happen to, uh, to have uh, more views uh, from the caregivers and the children on the question of neglect and child protection in humanitarian settings. And not in a conventional way, not in the way which is kind of codified in the UNCRC, but kind of uh, from the perspective of the caregivers who are at the receiving end of that system of the humanitarian action and how this affect them directly and affect their capacity to provide for, uh, for their children. But I can see that uh, my colleague Jason Hart just joined, so maybe Welcome, he, he, he would like also to say a few words about in response to that question as yes. well. Yes, and just for the participants to know, Jason couldn't attend the earlier part of the session because he was in a, a, a se another session. So welcome, Jason. Thank you very much. Can, can everyone hear me okay? Can you hear me? Hello? Very well, thank you. Oh, you can. Good. Hi, thank you. I'm, I'm so sorry to have missed, I'm sure, what was a very uh, interesting and uh, insightful discussion so far and presentations. Um, on the question of accountability, one thing, and I'm sorry this has already been said, um, one thing I think is really important in relation to the strategy of the Alliance is actually, well, yes, of course, children's participation is, is vitally important. We all agree on that. But so is the importance of the um, caregivers as well. 
and ensuring that we're accountable to caregivers and that we listen to the voices of caregivers. And in our study, one of the things that was striking was that there was quite a, a very high degree, in fact, of commonality between the concerns raised by children, and the concerns raised by their caregivers. And I think that's often when we think about child participation in children's voices, it's predicated on an assumption that there's a big difference between parents and children. And that's not what we found. The big difference was between parents and children or the community on one side and humanitarian organizations on the other in terms of the issues, protection issues that were being identified, the ways of working, who was excluded, who was in, uh, included and so on. Big differences there. And so I hope moving forward, forward that the Alliance, when it thinks about and talks about accountability, it doesn't focus only on the participation and the listening to the voices of children, but really engages with, with, um, with caregivers. And that's certainly been the focus of our research in terms of how, as Mohammed has explained, how the humanitarian system as a whole actually, in many cases, functions in, a, in an adverse way to actually help to create uh, neglect through not supporting adequately caregivers. Thank you, Jason. Yes, I think we need to work along the whole socio-economic ecological model with looking at the child participation and then uh, all of the other duty bearers around the child when we think about accountability. We've got now some other questions that have come in on the chat box. There's, uh, I think, four addressed to Joy and two addressed to Mike and our show. I'll read off the first one for Joy and then I'll paste the rest in the chat. Um, so I'll, pay, I'll paste them all in the chat, but I'll read them all out now quickly. And some of these have been responded to on the chat, so you can be a bit brief if you've already responded to them there. So do you have any evidence on how the involvement of children made a change in adults' awareness? We've also got, how did you select the children participating in the study? Um, what were some of the challenges and lessons with regards to the methodology and any ad adaptations made? I believe that's the one you already responded to saying it was largely just um, translating it, but it was quite easy to adapt. Um, yeah, that's, that's the three questions. So over to you, Joy. Thank you, Camilla. And thank you for the questions. Um, maybe I would start with the first one about the um, evidence, uh, whether adults change their awareness. Um, as this is just the first round of CPHA as they are being done in Northwest Syria context. So um, from our first experience, um, it also surprised us that adults uh, in the project areas that were not aware of some of these child protection concerns that children are experiencing. So it, it, um, it, we assume that uh, most of them were aware of it, but after this exercise, then we got to know that we, we have to do more work to um, uh, raise their awareness on certain issues. So that is very helpful. And it also um, uh, helps us to understand that there is very limited opportunity for children to share their concern with the adults. So in our future programming, that is definitely one of the key priorities that we wanted to strengthen and create more such opportunity. So in terms of evidence, we don't have much uh, right now as this is just the first round. But if we are doing it on a regular basis, then we'll be able to measure that whether such awareness will increase after um, our interventions or whether there's still more work needs to be done. Um, in terms of the selection of participants, um, as we have our ongoing projects uh, in, the, in the community where we conducted the CPHA ADAPT, so we did some mobilization through our uh, facilitator. Um, uh, for those children who benefit uh, in our program, then they get to know about this CPHA ADAPT. Uh, for those who might not have direct access to some of our um, uh, child protection center or other facility, then there were also outreach activities uh, to, to mobilize them to, to um, uh, participate. But uh, we do uh, set uh, age limits, uh, kind of an age limit uh, for the children's groups as we felt some of the um, question might be uh, handled by uh, older age children. So we recruit children between the age of 11 to um, below 18 for the children's group discussion. So I hope I answer the, the questions. 
Thanks. I think so, but if uh, anyone wanted to ask a further question, they can do so on the chat. I popped a few of the questions that came in for Mike and Arsha into the chat. I know you've responded there, but obviously it doesn't get picked up in the recording. And I see, luckily, Mike, your hand is up anyway, so you can either come in on those or your other point you wanted to make. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Kamala. And just we just have a few minutes before we'll hand over to Elena sure. to close. Us. I will need just one minute to answer those questions. Thank you. So uh, thank you for the questions. And uh, regarding the first one, which is about trafficking, our point is, uh, regardless of religion, trafficking is a child protection concern. It's forbidden, and we are against it. And, and hence, we found out of our research, which did not, as, as I responded in the chat, did not necessarily focus on trafficking, but it was uh, speaking to violence against children, including ex exploitation. And uh, this, the, uh, all of the faith leaders from different denominations, and those included Muslim and Christian faith leaders with their um, the variety in sects. So we're talking about Maronite, uh, 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 Sunni, Shia, uh, Protestant, uh, Christians, and uh, uh, with the diversity of Christianity, of course, in Lebanon with the sects. Uh, they are against child labor, against child marriage, and against the, uh, the trafficking for sure. Uh, so I hope I answered that question, uh, uh, or both questions. I just have two points to add to the implications of our findings. One is that uh, faith leaders, which is a major finding in our research, it, they perceive their role at the community level, uh, educating parents, while in fact they have a huge influence, influential role in policy change, and that is not yet realized. So we encourage people to, uh, uh, to really address those and engage faith leaders in policy change, in behavior change at the community level, because they have a lot of leverage to do there. Uh, and with the right programming, we can achieve that. Another point is that accountability to children is perceived by faith leaders as a child-centered decision-making, perhaps in courts, but that is not achieved if the women-centered decisions are not realized. So that's a very important point to make about custody of children uh, in relation to policy and laws. Thank you. And I hand it over, maybe Arsho has some points to add, maybe not, so thank you so much. Elena, would you? Yeah, do we have time? I think Ash, Ash, if you can, uh, if you can, in one minute, like add your points, like that would be sure. great. I can. I will do that uh, fast. Just for the second question about the diversity and different sects that Mike already uh, somehow answered, uh, we handpicked uh, all the faith leaders and made sure that all diversity were uh, present. Just to uh, clear it out that the research took place in two different major cities in Lebanon, which is Beirut and Mount Lebanon, and uh, we call it T5 or the, the, the North Tripoli area. And both, we made sure that both both areas have um, all uh, sects or denomination uh, uh, represented here. Uh, and we made sure that not just uh, male faith leaders, but also female faith leaders in different sects and denominations are also represented to have um, more diverse and uh, 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 experience pre uh, present in our research. So um, that that made our research really uh, diverse and uh, strong in that way, in the representatives of the faith leaders, though the, it was really diverse. And I see that, Mohamed, you have your hand up, but it needs to be a really short. Just 30, 30 seconds. I just like <laughs> to use Go. this opportunity to thank you all. Also to tell you that we are about to publish our uh, report uh, as a result of that study. We are now in the dissemination phase and uh, we'll be happy to share the report. I have received many uh, private messages from the participant showing interest in the report and uh, uh, thank you, Jason. We just shared the report. Thank you all and uh, would uh, will uh, will be happy to to receive also feedback and questions on our emails as well uh, after the session. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mohamed, and thanks to you all the speakers and Camilla for coordinating production company interpreters. Everyone, um, there are one. My, my last thought to summarize this is super briefly, as I have like a um, limited time availability, is that I liked the way Joy put the our role is in 
supporting how to create an environment that like facilitates like conversations between adults and um, children and those adults could be caregivers as like you know Jason and Mohammed's studies was promptly or was prompting as well as well you know those discussions involving faith leaders and more generally working across the socio-ecological model as uh, we as Camilla prompted so thank you all I think it's you know, a very long conversation. You're welcome to continue on Philo, or there are other activities foreseen for the rest of the annual meeting sessions, including a discussion on the infographic gallery that you can access right after this, or you can pause, take a break, and join us like for sessions that are starting a little bit later, like a, um, a table talk with other working group and task forces lead and other interesting sessions later in the day. So thank you very much, everyone, and um, thanks to the production company, interpreters, speakers, and everyone. And well done, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a great day.